Wait, 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 wait. This is gonna be awesome. Drink water, it's good for you. What is up guys, it's Sam from the Axe Pals again, and today, today we're talking about one of my favorite things in the world, and that is recording distorted guitars. So, I'm a little unsure about the best way to make this video, because on the one hand, I want it to be interesting and relevant to the seasoned veterans out there, but at the same time, I want it to be thorough and helpful to beginners who are just getting into recording and might not have some of the foundation level knowledge for all of this to make sense. In the interest of accommodating both of those perspectives, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of talking, and it's probably going to be pretty fast. We're getting nerdy, folks! Woo! So, grab a coffee, crack a beer, stand up and stretch, do whatever you gotta do because today is gonna be a long one. Without further ado, this is how I record guitars most of the time for Axe Palace demos, specifically the Rectifier Comparison video in 2019. Let's get into it. Wa-bam! Alright, so to cut time, we're going to assume that we've already written some riffs and picked a guitar and pickup combination that suits the material. Once we've done that, the first place our signal is going to go is into our DI box. For that, we're using an Avalon U5, but really any DI box will do. There's a mic cable in the back sending the dry guitar sound to our interface and then into Pro Tools. I record completely dry DIs of everything just in case I want to reamp later or reuse the track to demo other gear. For the comparison videos, we record reamped performances for each amp to ensure that the source signal for each amp is identical in both performance and level. Pro tip for gain staging your reamps. If you plug the output from your reamp box back into the input of your DI box, you can use the meter that measures the dry DI box signal to compare how loud your reamp box output is relative to how loud your guitar is when it's plugged into the DI box itself directly. If the reamp box is louder, you might find that when you send the signal back through your chain that your guitar DI track sounds like it has more gain or hotter pickups than when you initially recorded it. Conversely, if the reamp box is quieter than your guitar, you might find that you need to turn the gain up on the amp, which will introduce more hiss and noise. This extra step is not imperative, but will help ensure you maintain consistent levels across the different stages of your guitar production. Personally, I usually aim to have my measured peaks from any given source around negative six decibels to leave myself some headroom. Back to the signal chain. The through output from our DI box runs over to our little pedal setup, which is usually just an overdrive and a noise gate, but sometimes we throw a compressor in there as well. My personal favorite overdrive and the one we used for the rectifier video is the MXR Custom Badass Modified OD. Wait, wait, wait. One second, one second. This guy, really good. Favorite overdrive. I've also been on Ibanez new tubes kick lately. That's another great one. You should definitely check that out. The compressor usually gets used for leads and cleans, but sometimes for rhythms as well. The thought process behind using the compressor for rhythms is that the reason I often hear from people who like more gain is that they like the way that it feels. A lot of times that feel is a natural compression that comes from oversaturating the signal, but it comes at the expense of creating a lot of hiss and noise. By using a compressor lightly with the right settings, you can help simulate the feel of having a lot of gain, which will allow you to turn the gain on the amp down. Because the compressor is helping to retain the feel of having a lot of gain, you end up with a cleaner recording and a happy Chris Kelly. Note that the effectiveness of this will vary depending on what amp and pickups you're using, what the material's like, and which compressor you use. Sometimes it sounds bad, real bad. One of my favorite compressors to use for this purpose is the Earthquaker Warden, and one that I love for cleans but would advise against using for this purpose is the MXR Dynacomp. Moving on from the noise gate, we run into this JHS buffered splitter, which basically just gives me two outputs so that I can send the sound from the pedals to two different places. One output goes back to the desk and into either an Axe FX or a tuner, and the other goes into our Kahayan switching system to be sent to the amps. If you're not familiar with the Kahayan, I found out about it from a Tim Pierce video, showed Nick, and it quickly became one of our favorite pieces of guitar technology in recent history. Basically, it's an amp switching system that allows you to plug one input source into eight different amp heads and four different cabinets simultaneously and switch between them as quickly as you can turn the knob. The new ones have buttons and MIDI functionality and some other cool features, but I'm not cool enough for that. Anyway, what we have in the amp section isn't too relevant here, but what we have in the cabinet section is kind of cool. So, cabinet two goes to an Engel 212 with vintage 30s that we have to reference what an amp should sound like in the room, and cabinet one goes back to the desk and into our Two Notes Torpedo Studio that we use to record everything. With regard to amp volume going into the Torpedo, Torpedo, I usually have the master volume on the head somewhere between noon and one o'clock. From there, I adjust the gain on the torpedo so that the meter peaks again around negative six dB 
beat, when I really just bah, beat the out of it, you know? For the rectifier comparison, both master volumes were at noon. In the torpedo, we're running two IRs of that exact angle 212 that I made with my friend Francesco Filigoy last year. If you don't know Francesco, he's super awesome. You should check him out. I'm gonna link him in the description down there. Before making the IRs, I was miking the cab, so I can attest for you purists that the IRs sound at least as good as the old mic setup. Probably better, considering that we used a robotic mic arm to record them in a better room than I was using before. We took IRs of a ton of different mics in a wide range of positions. I think seven or eight SM57s, two SM7Bs, a Beta 57, and a few other weird choices. But the two that we're using for every video are one of the Beta 57 and one of the SM7B, blended favoring the Beta. Now, that was a lot of information. Someone sitting somewhere wondering when we switch topics from recording guitar to underwater warfare. That's cool, let me explain. IR stands for impulse response. I'm not going to get too technical or talk about how to make them in this video, but the practical application is that it's basically a digital snapshot of what a cabinet and mic combination sounds like with the sound of the room that it was recorded in baked into that snapshot. Because it's a digital file, you need a way to get your amp sound into it. And because your amp needs somewhere to send the power from the speaker output to, you need some way to bridge that gap. Enter the Two Notes Torpedo. The torpedo is a load box, which means it can handle the power from your head as if it were a real cabinet, but without the noise that comes with speakers. The beauty of the torpedo over other load boxes, though, is that it's digital, and more specifically, that it allows you to load in your own IRs, which you can play through with zero latency in real time, just like if your head was plugged into a cabinet with two mics on it. But your head isn't plugged into a cabinet, so you can crank it up at three in the morning and not hear a thing. Remember when your bassist Kevin kicked over the mic stand and you lost the tone that you used to record the first nine of the ten tracks of the album? I don't. Torpedo. Forever. What that means for our channel and you guys as viewers though, is that every demo will be perfectly consistent in terms of cabinet sound and mic placement. And since we have the cabinet that produced those IRs less than three feet away, we're always careful to reference our mix back to the in-room sound to ensure that we're providing you guys with the most accurate representation of the amp that we can. Back to nerd stuff! We're running the torpedo at 96k sample rate because to me it sounds the best and there's glory in excess. That then goes into the Apollo via Spitif with each mic panned hard so that I can mix them on independent faders and Pro Tools in case I ever want to second guess the blend I have saved in the torpedo. As I've touched on, the interface we're using is the Universal Audio Apollo and I'm recording everything in Pro Tools 12. We're running the Apollo and Pro Tools at 48k for a couple reasons. First, because the cameras are recording at 48 so the Premiere session's at 48 and second, to avoid clicks and pops from a sample rate mismatch with the torpedo. It does result in bigger files, but more samples is more better, so uh, enjoy it. With that, I think I'm gonna close this video off because there's been a lot to digest and I'm sure we're both thoroughly exhausted. If you've made it this far, much respect, much appreciation. What'd you think though? Was this helpful? I thought this was fun. Maybe I'll make another one talking about bass and drums or mixing or cameras or who knows what. Would you guys be into that? Like a little series about each step? Or would you prefer that we worked on releasing that IR pack? Let me know in the comments below. That's all I got guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something. Hit the thumbs up button if you like this video. Subscribe for more content like this, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace! And I'm recording everything in Pro Tools 12. Uh, uh. Running the Apollo and Pro Tools. Time, baby, one line at a time.